So this is all about preparedness. I would like to be clear with everyone listening right now that I know my work. I talk about a lot of things that could potentially affect you directly. But one way or another, we know that whatever happens to this country will affect you or someone you know. So it might make sense to diversify your money with precious metals. And that is why I partnered with Gold Co because I believe that this could be the best way to help. And this is about taking control of your freedom, financial freedom. We know we can't predict the future, but we can certainly prepare for it. Okay, it says we're live, so I have to go and check. Hold on a second. Yeah, that's fine. It, better, better verify it, right? Uh, yeah, because yeah. Uh, they didn't. Uh, something weird going on here, as usual. Okay, yes, we are live. Good. Whoops. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I'm here today or tonight with Michael Schratt, and he's actually um, a great colleague and friend. I mm -hmm. consider him a friend. I've known him for many, many years, and he's been on my show numerous times in the past, um, and more sporadically in the last few years through his choice, not mine. <laughs> oh, so okay. it's really great to have him here on the show, and um, I posted one of his new videos on my telegram channel. So if you're, if you want to see, you know, some of the stuff he does, I always post his videos on my telegram, but you can also go to his YouTube channel. Correct, Mike? That is correct. Okay. And do you want to give it out? Like we can put it, the link um, on the page, but is there a way to find you? How, how would you? Uh, it, it's just my name in YouTube. That's it. Michael Shrett. That's all, all you have to do. And you know, okay. Carrie, I want to thank you for helping me start all this. Cause you will recall, okay. we did the first one together. Yeah. I forgot about there that. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Great. Uh, all right. So I'm going to let you kind of run with this. Um, I did yeah. want to talk a little bit about the subject of your latest video, the Black okay. Project's Black Budget, right. because that involves the Secret Space Program. And mm -hmm. I am very interested in how Space Force and right. the Secret Space Program underground and off planet, for that matter, uh, really how they interact what their relationship is like. And I don't expect you to know that, but I wondered if you have any sort of hints in that direction. And also, can you describe from my audience, the black budget, the black projects and how that all comes together in aerospace? Sure. Well, uh, I think the best thing to do is, you know, when you talk about black programs, I like to reference my sources and that's why in that video, I gave the newspaper clippings. I got. I gave the names. I gave the dates. Um, I gave the uh, names of the publications where people can actually go to find out how much we've been spending on these programs. And you know, when you start looking at this over decades and years, and especially the Reagan buildup, eighty-one to eighty-six, it's clear that they had a blank check, and whatever they wanted, defense contractors, they got the money. They got the money there. At the very least, there are 12 previously unknown manned black programs right now sitting in a hangar somewhere in Palmdale Air Force Plant 42 or at the test site, could be Tonopah Test Range, at least 12 that we don't even know about. 12 manned programs that were failures, maybe it didn't work quite the way they thought it would, but there are a lot more birds out there than we're being told. And, you know, as taxpayers, we have a right to question authority. And it's it's important to keep in mind, and Jim Goodall is the expert on this, the United States Air Force, uh, they really don't own anything, right? They are temporary custodians for those assets. So we, we own the runways, we own the buildings, we own the aircraft, and we have a right to know where our tax dollars are going. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and I actually kind of feel the same way about our military that's supposed to be serving us Correct. as opposed to the Biden show or the CCP or whoever else they're serving at the current moment. Uh, so there's that aspect. There's also, uh, now I, don't, I think I'm going to bring this up here just really briefly because I thought this was a, a great uh, slide, so I'm going to share it with the audience. This came from you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so hold on. Let's see what is going to, how this is going to work. Great. Okay. So I think that's sure. on the screen. Sure. Yep. Aerospace Alley, you called Correct. it. And, uh, sure. and, and can you talk about this slide a little bit? Sure. No problem. Well, you know, you got to be a crazy fool like me to do these kind of things, right? I mean, to start in San Diego and take, the highway up, you know, by the coast and, and visit all these places. You can go to Hawthorne to visit the Northrop facility. And then, you know, you keep making your way up through Los Angeles. You'll eventually get to the 14, you head up the 14, and now you're in Lancaster, Palmdale, Antelope Valley area. You've got Air Force Plant 42. All the major prime contractors are there. And then you would finish up at Edwards Air Force Base and Mojave. So this really is Aerospace Alley. And if someone's interested, I mean, you can certainly drive around these facilities. You can't get access to them. But this slide just shows you where these primary targets are, where these primary defense contractors are located. And they're all in the Southern California area. Okay, uh, right. And this is the interesting thing is, and you actually took, took me and I think... Um, my former uh, partner, whatever you want to call him, uh, up there, and we yes. drove all around there, right? That's right. We did. We did. And it's, it's been several years, but um, several it was years, right? really fascinating, right? And yep. uh, Michael is really an expert in this. Uh, I, I, I want to say that you have been an investigator for so many years, and you're an, ar you're an archivist as well, which is yeah. a very sure. important skill. And you have, um, do you what, do you actually have the rights to the Leonard Springfield Library? No, I don't, I don't have the rights to it. No, I don't have the rights okay. to it. I mean, technically, that would fall under the uh, the family, right? The family. Well, Leonard's gone. Dell right. is gone. Um, there's some family members left, and the sixty-five three ring binders are under the jurisdiction of Mufon at this time. So that's where that lies. Now there are still. These mysterious 22 bank boxes of material that I've been trying to track down for 13 years now, and it, it could be gone. It could be completely gone, but there's a possibility some of it still exists, but we, we can talk about that as we get through uh, this evening here. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I, I, I'll i let you continue. Um, you know, you're, Michael's going to go through these crash retrievals, right? Sure, absolutely. And uh, so, Michael, is you also you go to aerospace companies? You've interviewed some of the principals, right? Right. Yes. yes. Very well known. You know. Very well known. Yeah. The usual suspects, uh, as one might call them, and you also have been uh, something of a you're a historian, but you've been collecting materials yourself, right? Sure. Yes. And Correct. and building, I guess one might say, a library, and Correct. someday. You know, when I was trying to have like this um, Project Camelot, I don't even know what you, what what I was calling it, but anyway, um, place the center. I wanted uh -huh. you to be the the archivist and and oh, all that. Okay. So go ahead. Okay, so all right, I'm going to share my screen. <coughs> see, let's see if this works here. Share screen. Okay, and we'll go here. Share. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, slideshow from beginning. So are you seeing this, Carrie? Yes. Okay, you see it full screen, right? I do. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna start right here. Retrievals of the third kind. Cosmic crashes, corpses, and cover-ups. And really, if you get right down to it, this is this is really an homage to Leonard Stringfield. I, I mean, 
it's so important that we highlight this gentleman's work. Uh, and you can see as we go through some of these cases, we are way beyond, you know, racing the undertaker at this point. We're way beyond that. These original legacy firsthand military witnesses are dying by the day here. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's the final curtain call on crash retrievals here. This is the final curtain call. That's it. You know, it's up to us now. If we don't take the bull by the horns and make a management decision and get like drastic with this, we're never going to know because they're not going to tell us. That's exactly they're right. And, and Grush, when he, he testified before the UAP hearing uh, with a portion of Congress, uh, was very circumspect when he talked about crash retrievals and he acted as though they just thought of it yesterday. <laughs> well, and this goes you know, way back, right? Of course it goes way back. Oh, absolutely. All right, so let's continue here. And, and I'm not going to rush this. I'm going to take this real slow. There's no reason to rush. I'm going to just go very slowly take here. Take your time. Go uh, right Take ahead. my time. Take my time. UFO crash retrievals the ultimate holy grail of UFO research. And I kind of always ask the question, why is that the case? It's, it's very simple. It's very simple because the, the UFO crash retrievals contain the bodies, the debris, and the craft themselves. These are the three elements that we need to push this field forward, to move the ball forward in this. Anything less than those three, and we're spinning our wheels. We don't need any more UFO sighting reports. We, we've got thousands of those. That's not going to do us any good. We need to get to the hard physical evidence. Then we're going to move forward. And that's why the crash retrievals are so important in this. Okay, announcements here. Number one, the content of each case highlighted in this presentation has remained intact for the description of the original source. Number two, the identity of first-hand sources will be protected per Leonard Stringfield's original agreement with his military contacts. Number three, the visual aids used in this presentation are computer-generated forensic composite illustrations and sketches, which originated from the specific details provided by Leonard sources. Source material covered in this presentation include the following. So, Here's where Leonard got his sources and his information. These are the sources here. Three-star U.S. Air Force generals, U.S. Air Force fighter pilots, astronauts, commercial pilots, air traffic controllers, neurosurgeons, pathologists, theoretical physicists and mathematicians, U.S. Army officers, U.S. Navy officers, military police, high-level Pentagon officials, top military brass, scientists and engineers who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and other government facilities. So in other words, Carrie, we're dealing with the best of the best. We're dealing with the tip of the spear, firsthand military sources that held the bodies, held the debris, loaded up the craft on 18-wheeler tractor trailer, low boy trucks, and went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Those are the caliber of witnesses that Leonard was dealing with here. Awesome. Okay, we're going to move on here. A couple of quick quotes. Number one, UFO crash retrievals can't be real because if they were, I would have read about it in the local newspaper, okay, general public. Number two, there are not now nor ever have been any extraterrestrial visitors or equipment on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is their original press release, Carrie, not me. This is the original press release, July 1980. So I'm going to come back. Oh, yeah, we'll see about that. OK, so we're going to challenge them. Leonard Stringfield's crash retrieval witnesses against the U.S. Air Force. OK, big challenge here. So th this is the man of the hour. UFO crash retrieval, Leonard Stringfield. This is the man we're talking about. Over a 30 year period, he had identified. Mm, well, it was certainly more than two dozen, but multiple firsthand military witnesses and sources that dealt with the crash retrievals. And we'll go over some biographical points here. He was born in 1920, grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. By the time Leonard graduated from high school in 1939, he had already memorized the entire dictionary, like the kind of guy you want on your team to have this information <laughs> and memorize it. This is the kind of guy you want here. He joined the military as soon as he heard about the 
attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. After the war, he was employed by a chemical company in Ohio and retired after 30 years. Leonard wrote two books, Inside Saucer Post 3-0, 1957. Later, Situation Read the UFO Siege in 1977. Okay, next one. His lecture on UFO crash retrievals at the 1978 MUFON Symposium in Dayton, Ohio, caused an international sensation, okay? Now, why? Okay, simple, because this was the first time that a paper like this was ever presented, Retrievals of the Third Kind, and he presented 12 of his sources and all of the detailed information regarding what they were involved in with the crash retrievals, and it was a sensation. However, he got a lot of pushback, and there were people that had some serious tempers because and per the agreement that Leonard had with his witnesses, he would not reveal their identities. They had to keep the names under wraps. And so there was no way for people to do a third party independent analysis on these because he wouldn't release the names. So it was kind of a two edged sword, but you can kind of see where Leonard was going with it all. He passed away December 18th, 1994. So it's been quite a long time now. Okay, so Cincinnati Inquirer. July 19th, 1993. Author continues quest for truth about UFOs. What I've collected has staggering implications for mankind. This would be the biggest thing since Christ, really. Yeah, it is. If even one of these are real, it's the biggest thing, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Right. Okay. Leonard maintained a collection of 22 bank boxes of original correspondence, letters, drawings, audio tapes, testimony from his sources. These witnesses should be located and their testimony should be presented before Congress. Now, I've tried to track down this mythical group of 22 bank boxes. To this day, I, I don't know the exact whereabouts. I know back in 1991, it was confirmed it did exist. Now, after Leonard passed away in 1994, it starts getting murky to try to track down this information. Now, I did talk to one of the family members, and I was told personally by this family member that what Leonard wanted published, he published in the status reports. The rest of it was thrown out. Now, I don't know if the guy was lying to me. Maybe he was. Maybe it's still sitting there. Wow. But we have lost a tremendous part of our national history, if that's the case, okay? So what we're going to try to do is salvage what we can from the information that we do have available here. Uh, and I want to okay. highlight this point. Now, uh, so wait, wait, wait one second. I just want to ask you, um, I hope this is okay to say, um, aren't there some warehouses or a warehouse down somewhere around Newport Beach that contained a lot of Leonard Stringfield's materials? What happened well, to that? The 65 three ring binders are still under the jurisdiction of MUFON at Lunkin Airport, in Cincinnati. So we have all that. That's all That's all good. But that's not the original 22 bank right. boxes. Okay. Those are the internal dictation notes at the office. It's still very good information. Still very good information, but it's not quite the 22 bank boxes. So we're going to do what we can with what we have. And I wanna highlight this book I have on the screen here. This is a copy of the book. Everything that we're gonna be going through tonight is referenced in this book. So UFO crash retrievals, the complete investigation status reports, all the status reports are in this document. And Carrie, as you, as you go through this document here, you can see that this is not for the faint of heart. You have to be someone really interested in this subject matter to actually get into this because it's very labor intensive. There's a lot of reading. There's no visual aids. There's basically no pictures. There's no drawings. There are no full color uh, illustrations. And so three years ago, I thought, you know, what needs to happen? Someone needs to go through this book with a fine tooth comb dig out all the mission critical cases and commit those to a very good refined pencil drawing. From that, we use that as a guide to do a full color rendering. And for the past three years, that's what I've been involved in, wow. trying to make these cases come alive and preserve an important part of our national history. That's the goal in all of this here. So mm -hmm. let's continue on here. 
Uh, okay, Carrie, would you go to Vegas if you knew the odds were 119 to one in your favor? Okay, so if you went to Vegas and you went to a roulette wheel and it had 120 spaces, and we've got 119 crash retrieval cases within the Stringfield publication, and we we bet 109, we're going to win every time. We almost can't lose. So the odds are on our favor here. Okay, now all we need is one of these accounts to be true, and the whole argument for non-existence of crash retrievals completely falls apart, Carrie. All we need is one. That's it. The odds are on our favor. So it's really 119 to one on their end. They're, the the odds are on our favor. We almost can't lose here. All right, I want to give credit to Rudy Gardea. He's my artist that did all the pencil sketches. Want to give him credit for his work. And we will start our presentation here, Kerry. This is 1942. So already we're five years prior to Roswell. We're already five years prior to Roswell here. This right. is at an army base north of Georgia. Okay, even Leonard didn't know where this thing came down, but it was an army base north of Georgia. This thing was 15 feet across, 10 feet high. When it came down, it ripped a hole breach on the side of the craft, like on the ledge of the building. Okay, so there was a hole breach. Now there were four crew members taken alive, and there were three divider segments in this craft. The upper part, which Rudy has done in this detailed drawing here, the upper level, which you could call the level one, it had a display screen with buttons and switches and dials and levers. Below that, there was a kind of a main section that had what looked like four bar stools, and they were parked behind a wraparound window. On the bottom level, there was an entryway hatch. Okay, so that's kind of the, the breakdown on this. And these beams were about five feet tall. They had oversized head, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth, minute nose. They had milky white skin. Now, I want to mention, wrapped around the outer circumference of the bottom of this craft were what looked like indented hieroglyphic type writing. Let's go to the next slide here, do a little bit of a blow up here. And this is something, Carrie, that we see on a number of these crash retrieval cases. Some are discovered at the bottom of the ocean off the coast of Okinawa, we're seeing craft with hieroglyphic writing. So I'm thinking somewhere there's got to be a transnational team of white lab coat technicians that are desperately trying to crack the code in linguistics to try to figure out what all this means. There's got to be catalogs of this stuff and people trying to figure all this out. There, there's got to be by default. There's got to be here. All right, next one, Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, 1946. Tex Martin is the primary eyewitness. He was six years old at the time. This is UFO crash retrievals, page 242, 243 in the book. So if there's anyone interested in reading more, I just invite you to, to get this book and you can just follow right along here. Now, we wanna keep in mind that in 1946, it was still Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. It had not become Wright-Patterson Air Force Base until October 1947. So we're still talking about Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. Now, this young boy, Tex Martin, he accompanies his father, who is kind of an avionics engineer at the base, and he's there for an entire week. He did very good in, in school, and so his father let him join him at at the base for an entire week. And so they're at this cafeteria section that's connected by a doorway to this main hangar area. And he's talk, this is the, the young boy, he's talking to a, a custodian and this custodian buys this young six-year-old boy a soda pop from the vending machine. Now, while all this is going on, there's these two panel doors that close shut but not before this boy got a look inside this hangar, okay? And then off to the left of these panel doors, there was this doorway that was opened up, and he looked inside this doorway. What did he see? Here's a first pass rendering here. This is kind of the, the interworkings of the beginning of the illustration. So he's looking through this doorway, and he sees, this is the first pass rough sketch by, by Rudy here, he sees two 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boys with mysterious debris covered by a tarp and chains. And often to the background, 
there's a 20 foot diameter dish shaped craft with tripod pogo landing gear. And he's looking at all this, okay? Let's go to the next slide. Here's the first pass rough illustration. So there were at least three ET bodies laying on the floor on stretchers, two 18 wheeler tractor trailer low boy trucks with mysterious debris. We don't know what it was. Might have been from something else. Who knows? But they were there. And uh, a couple of Jeeps were there. But he's, and you can see him in the background. So let's take everything that we got from the report that Leonard had published in his briefing document. And we'll put that together with Rudy's drawing. And we'll go to the full refined drawing, Carrie. And here's what we came up with. Now we can see this case coming into view here. The little boy's looking through this uh, doorway in the background. Uh, this craft, which was about 20 feet in diameter, it had a raised flat section that was wrapped around the outer circumference. And there were at least three ET bodies laying on the ground on structures next to the craft. Now, while all this is going on, by day four, which would have been Thursday, because he was there for the entire week, there was a colonel that saw this little boy again kind of looking through this doorway and the father got reprimanded big time he got in serious trouble he was actually fired over this so he lost his whole job by break bringing his son into this but what we want to do now Carrie, is we want to take this illustration this very good refined drawing and let's go to the full color rendering and this is what christopher payne came up with joel christopher payne came up with this full color rendering this thing was off white in color, a little bit of a different color that we usually see. Usually we see these chrome metallic reflective aluminum metallic type craft. This one was off white in color, but just to give an idea of what this may have looked like if we were there back in 1946. Okay, next one. Right Field, Dayton, Ohio, 1946. The primary source was a private in records management and the source on this one is Space, the Final Frontier, page 59 by Clark McClellan. So this private records management, he had a friend who worked at the base. He was an MP. So let's go to the next slide here. This shows you the cover of the book of where I got this information. And this MP told <clears throat> this private who was del delivering this important uh, letter to a high-level military brass person at the base here. He said, you know what? I got something I want to show you. So he brought him to the back side of the hangar, and sitting on the hangar floor was a 15-foot diameter dish-shaped craft, seven feet tall. It had a flat section wrapped around the outer circumference. This is the original sketch from the report. There was a section of uh, wraparound transparent windows. There was a three-foot diameter central column that rose from the center part of the craft up through the center and connected to the top. And Carrie, there were no rivets. There were no seams. There were no welds. There were no socket head fasteners. There were no hmm, any type of fasteners on this thing. This thing was antiseptically sterile. It had looked like it was built on a 3D printer on the atomic level building atoms upon each other. That's what it looked like. So let's go to my AutoCAD drawing. And if you look in the upper right here, you can see the cutaway that I've done to peel back the skin to show the interior here. And I want to bring your attention to this little red dot on the, you can call it the one just to the left of the center window. That red dot, Carrie, is the attempted point of entry where they were using diamond tip drill bits to get into this. And I've got two other cases within this collection where we have these white lab coat technicians that are desperately, and I'm talking about desperately, trying to breach the hull of these craft and they can't get in. They cannot get in. So let's go to the next slide. And now you can see my rather childish first pass illustration that I did just to give an idea of what this may have looked like here. And let's try to do a little better rendering here. This is by <clears throat> Joseph Wraith. I want to give credit to Joseph Wraith. And he did a, a really good job making this thing come alive. You can see this kind of polished aluminum exterior. He's actually peeled back the skin in the detail view on the upper right that shows you the central column. That's something that we see on a lot of these craft, even on the ARVs, this central column running through the center. So 
Is that where they're getting the idea for all this? All right, let's go to Ruby's drawing. Now, in this, in the Okay, now wait one second. This And this happened, this was 1940s, right? This is 1946 before Roswell. Yeah. Yep. Okay, just this, wanted to re-emphasize that. This came in from a railroad car from Arkansas. That's where this thing came in from. Okay, can I ask you one other thing? Uh, yes. Has Have you ever attempted to get in touch with Grush or has he ever tried to contact you? I'm small fries and carry. I don't have those kind of contacts. Yeah, but you've got all the evidence. <laughs> well, you know, that's you know? how it rolls, you know. You I, do. I don't, I don't have those kind of contacts. Well, he... He should be looking at your your stuff well, and your books who knows? and everything. Who knows? There, right. There's got to be somebody that goes down and drills down and, and, and re remains and keeps this history alive. Somebody's got to do it, right? Somebody does. Okay, so continuing on here. In the foreground, carry we've got the toolbox. This is all in the report. Off to the left, there was a small electric drill with a diamond tip drill bit that shows up in three other cases. Off to the right of this drawing here, there was a tarp that was folded up. So let's take everything we got from the original report and the sketch. We'll tie that in with Rudy's drawing here, and we'll go to the full color rendering. And here's what Joseph came up with here. Now we can see nice. this coming into view here. Right. And as we go through these cases, you know, the craft count goes up, the body count goes up, and it's becoming more and more difficult for the United States government to keep all this concealed, right? So they have to diversify their portfolio. So they have some assets at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They put some assets at McDill Air Force Base. They put some assets at Eglin Air Force Base. They put a couple of craft at Edwards, you know, they spread these things out. They can't have no single point failure. So they have to spread out all these assets here. Let's go to the next one here. Papagos Indian Reservation, west of Globe, Arizona, January, 1947. So we're already two in, and we're still not at Roswell yet. North of Superstition Mountains, primary source served in the U.S. Navy during World War II. The source for this was UFO crash retrievals, page 93, case A-10. So if anyone wants to follow in the book, you can read more details. All right, so we've got the primary eyewitness with his friend. They're kind of homesteading. They're in this Jeep. And they're on an unimproved road. They're going through the desert terrain. And they're stopped by two MPs. And they're challenged. They're asked for identification. Not, but <clears throat> while all this is going on, they look off to the left about another 250 feet. And there's this 30-foot diameter dish-shaped craft that augured in at a 40-degree angle. It had a dome on top. There were two rings wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft, and then carry it had what looked like these indented window sections that were wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft. Now they were told to immediately vacate the area, but they got there at the right time because this was the very early stages of the crash retrieval operation. So it was a lot harder to keep under under wraps because it was very early. So we're going to take the report from Leonard. We're going to tie that in with Rudy's drawing, and we're going to go to the full color rendering here. And this is what Joseph Payne came up with, just to give an idea cool. of what we're talking about here. And and again, this is 1947, so we're already that's, that's awesome. I love and, that. Yeah, and we haven't even hit Roswell yet. Now, if you factor in Cape Girardeau in 1941, and then you factor Battle Los Angeles, where allegedly two more craft were recovered. And then you factor in 1933, Italy crash retrieval case. Now we're six and seven in, and we haven't even got to Roswell yet. All right, right. let's keep on going here. White Sands Missile Range, July 4th, 1947. Now we're finally at Roswell. This is a technical sergeant, U.S. Army Air Force. That's the military firsthand source for this information. UFO crash retrievals, page 196. Now on this one, I've shown you the perimeter of White Sands Missile Range, and we're gonna to go to the next slide here. And this is what it looked like when it came down. This is a 150 foot diameter dish shaped craft. Carry this entire operation took place at night. So they had to bring in these light alls, they had to bring in these spotlights, they had these um, gigantic lighting, different sections that were basically lighting up the entire scene. 
there were people with Geiger counters, searchlights, Geiger counters going around this thing, checking for radioactivity. They had some tents off to the right. There was a six by six troop transport. Obviously there were Jeeps there, military personnel. Now I also wanna mention they had both still camera photography going on and they had motion picture film going on. So they've got evidence of this, Carrie. Uh, we're talking still photography and motion picture film reels. It's a done deal, they've already got it. So let's go to the full color rendering and this might be what it looked like if we were there back in 1947. Just an incredible sight. And right. beautiful. You know, we got to get to this evidence before it's too late. So we're gonna go to the actionable item here. Since still photography and motion picture film reel was recorded of this event, senators and congressmen with the appropriate security clearances should track down and utilize this evidence for future public hearings. That needs to happen now. But there's a problem here because there's a lot of senators and congressmen that don't have a need to know and they have not been read into these programs. So how can they get access to something that they've never been read into? That's what we're running up against in Congress right now. We're running well, up against Okay, but let me also say that Luna and uh, Burkett, I think they're both in Congress, right? They were at the... UAP hearing, right. and they also met with the press afterwards. And Burkett, I think, has been pretty present, even in in the media ever since then. Really, uh, he, they are, you know, they were barred. They were among the members barred uh, from right. the uh, the base, right, to where they were supposed to be shown some craft. Uh, and and which base was that? Do you, was it well, Rick Patterson it, or? Th this one was just out at White Sands Missile Range. No, but I mean the Burkett and, do you remember the Burkett and I, Luna? I don't know specifically they were which one they Yeah, were I, I, it was, I think, somewhere over, it might have been Ohio, it might have been, you know, somewhere over there. But anyway, um, just saying that these people are trying to get access to see this stuff. It's kind right. of amazing to think about, but our members of Congress do not have access. They don't That's have correct. high enough clearances to get the, the real information That's or to correct. see the craft. So That's you need a special correct. ticket item. And uh, <laughs> I know that Catherine Austin Fitz is one person that was invited to see a body at least. Uh, I don't know about a craft. And she is a financial um consultant kind of person and she was the housing secretary i think under wow i forget who it was it might have been reagan or whoever it was mm -hmm. um anyway so she has quite a resume uh she declined to see the body because <laughs> she i guess body. she she thought it was going to be too shocking or she couldn't handle it or something since then she's really gotten into black projects and exactly what you're talking about have you ever talked with her? I know of her. She's a great researcher. Absolutely great researcher. Yes. Right. She's got fantastic research. And okay. Is she problem, aware of your work? That's my is question. Is she aware of my work? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, this is just insane. So these people, they need to get, get together on the same team. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the other problem we're running into, Carrie, is that the dirty deal that the United States government cut with the defense contractors early on, like in the early 1940s on all this, the, the dirty deal they cut is that the government said, I don't care what you do, you know, uh, regarding these craft. All we want to know is how these things work so we can exploit the technology for weapons advancement. You know, that's really what they did. So they said, you're welcome to commercialize it. You can allow it to trickle down into the commercial industry. You can make billions on it. All we want to know is how this works. So what this ends up happening then is that this information associated with the crash retrievals is not necessarily classified. It's proprietary. And that's why the defense contractors, they paid off like the high level military brass at the Pentagon and, and, and also in Congress to keep these things under wraps. And that's what we're up against here. So it's proprietary. Oh, that's, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Message. Okay, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's that's, that's another level of secrecy. 
All right, UFO crash retrieval 1947, seen in a warehouse of all places Ber at Berkeley University. Albert Bruce wow. Collins, deceased, is the primary eyewitness. He was a metallurgical engineer. UFO crash retrievals, page 197 is the re reference in the book. Now, he was at the right place at the right time when this 18-wheeler tractor-trailer low boy backed into Berkeley University warehouse. Can you believe it or not? That's how it went down. So let's go to the drawing here. And what he saw was <laughs> this 30 foot long egg shaped craft on the tractor trailer, about 15 feet tall. And this thing literally looked like a cracked egg. Okay, so you've got this crack going down the center of it. There was a composite panel on the forward section of this 30 foot long egg shaped craft. There was a three foot diameter egg yolk in the center that was wrapped around the outer circumference with another composite panel. There were two flat sections wrapped around the outer portion of it. And then, Carrie, if you look on the lower right, there was what looked like debris or shrapnel coming out of the lower right of this thing. So was this an internal implosion? Was this its own craft? Or was this a propulsion system of something much larger? If this thing's already 30 feet across and it goes in something larger, how large could that thing be? So that's something that we should consider as well. So. Let's take Rudy's drawing and we'll go to the full color rendering. And here's what Joseph Payne came up with here. And now you see our, our technician here, expert in metallurgical science. We've got the whole bridge on the side. Now, one thing we should keep in mind is it would be pretty hard to bring this out of Berkeley. But if we could get a small piece of debris carried out into the public dom domain that could be analyzed at a third independent analysis facility, then it would go a long way to helping some of this come out here because we really need to get this information handed into the hands of the scientific community as a united coalition. Next one, Carrot Patch, south of Salina, California, July, August, 1947. There was two 19 year old workers that actually came across this. Now they were alerted to this by the foreman who knew that it came down the night before. So the next morning, these two 19 year old workers, they're in this carrot patch and this foreman comes by and say, hey guys, you need to come over here and take a look at this. And what did they see? They see this, this is the original sketch from the report, 1947, nine foot diameter dish shaped craft, four feet tall, so it's not big. It has twin indented window sections wrapped around the outer circumference. And then we'll go to the next slide. X marks the spot. So according to this map, I can probably take you plus or minus 500 feet for where this thing came down. But it's a long time ago, so there wouldn't be any debris there. But off to the left, you can see Highway 1. You've got the 101. So technically, we could get very close to where this thing came down. And we'll go to the next slide here. This was the first pass AutoCAD drawing I did years ago that shows you what this thing looks like. Nine feet diameter. It has kind of a flat section on top, twin indented windows, and then four feet tall. And we'll go to the first pass full color illustration that I did a long time ago, just to give an idea of what this thing might look like. Right. And then we'll go to Rudy's drawing. So before the military got there, these two 19 year old boys go up to this thing. One have actually kicked the side of it with their boots. So he actually had contact with this thing. Now, within five minutes of these two boys arriving at the scene, the military gets there like they always do because they got to keep these crown jewels under wraps. They're told to vacate the area immediately, but they still were close enough to watch this entire retrieval operation. They eventually watched them bring the craft onto the 18-wheeler tractor trailer and then move it out of here. So this is all 1947 timeline. Now let's go to the full color rendering just to give an idea of what this thing actually looks like here if we were there at the scene. And uh, you can see the, the craft count keeps going up the further we go into these cases here. Wow. And uh, I'm gonna continue. And that's in Salinas, California, this right? Is in Salinas, California, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's correct. In a carrot patch of all places. All right, next one. C-119 flying boxcar. Sierra Madre, Madre Valley, Mexico, prior to 1941, uh, 1951. So 
My best guess, Carrie, is 1948 for this one. And the primary source was an engineer. He dealt with highway construction. This is page 32 in the book. And when the craft came down, the United States military asked for the assistance of this highway construction engineer. And basically, I'm going to go on to the next slide here. How do we know that this craft was nine feet in diameter? Simple, because if you take in a tape measure and you measure the interior wall width of the inside of the C-119 flying boxcar, it's nine feet 10. You have to allow five inches on either side for clearance. That gives you nine feet in diameter. It cannot be any wider than nine feet in diameter. So let's go to what this thing actually looks like. And here's Rudy's drawing. So you can see them trying to hoist this craft into the back clamshell doors of the cargo bay of the C-119. Just an incredible scene. Uh, so it's, we're not talking about a, a big craft here. Now, in the report, which was small, but still there and important, the primary eyewitness said that there were three bodies recovered and they were burnt. They were badly burnt. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the full color rendering here. And now you can see Joseph Wraith and what we've got here. In the background, you can kind of see this craft being brought into the clamshell doors. And in the foreground, you can see these burned bodies here. It, it was not a, a nice scene. This was a gruesome scene here. We'll do a little bit of a blow up. Now you can see the craft coming into view. And I'd like to know where this craft disappeared to, right? This is another one that they retrieved. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And now you can see these beings. Now in the report, it said that this construction engineer walked up to one of these bodies. He put his hand on their face. And then when he lifted it, his hand, the skin adhered to his fingers. So whatever or whoever these things were, it was it did not end well for them. They were charred uh, very drastically here. All right, next one, Na Naval Air Station, Sunnyvale, California, 1950, Hangar 1. Primary source was a radar operator. Now, Carrie, I know you Isn't know- Isn't that Moffett Field? Yes, that hangar is still, I've been in this- <laughs> I was born there. <laughs> you were born there, okay. Yeah, yeah. in Moffett fact- Moffett Field Carrie, Military Hospital. It's on the go. base there right go. there. This and and that's where I was messed with as well. So just oh, FYI. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie, this hangar is so large. Yeah. It has its own weather. And I know. How big this thing is. Okay? It is. And it's it's actually, you know, a national um, landmark and, yes. and should be pre Historic, preserved. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. I what I think they actually were doing was either building something around it on top of it or dismantling it uh last i saw driving by on the freeway they're doing something to that hangar okay i don't know if you heard okay. that I'm not sure if i heard that mm -mm. okay nope. all right so in this case the primary source was a radar operator and he walks into this hangar inadvertently runs into something incredible i'm going to go to the next slide here oh we'll go here we go and he sees this 80 to 100 foot diameter dish shaped craft. It had a small dome on top. This is Rudy's drawing. I want to give credit to him. There were porthole windows wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself. And he's challenged by a guard basically to forget what he's seen. It, it was there at the time. But I want to go up one more slide to back where we were. And I want to give you his statement here. This is what he said, quote, it was certainly no aircraft of ours. This was his assessment. So this is back in 1950. This large 100-foot diameter dish-shaped craft is parked in this hangar, and he walks in there and sees it by accident. That's something that kind of happens again and again. If you're at the right place at the right time, you can see these things, uh, like in the 40s and 50s. Since now, you know, they've locked these things down much more right. secure. But right. back in the day, you could you could see these things. All right. Now, Albuquerque Journal, March 18th, 1950. And these are all in numerical order here. Hundreds at Farmington report large force of flying saucers. Very important that we talk about this. Now, why is this important? We're talking about the early 50s here. Uh, shoot saucers down. 
Jet pilot so ordered in 24-hour error alert. This is Cincinnati Inquirer, July 29th, 1950. So 1952. In the early 50s, there was this standing order by the Air Force to our pilots to shoot these things down. They were desperately trying to shoot these things down. Absolutely. Here's some other newspaper clippings. Jets keep 24-hour alert for saucers. Pilots order to down <laughs> objects if they don't land. On the saucer trail, pilots told shoot them down. Jets on 24-hour alert to shoot down saucers. Okay, now these are the type aircraft that were scrambled to go chase these things and shoot them down. F-94 Starfire. And if you go to Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, you can see one of these things parked outside. Now it has the rocket flaps in the nose in the closed position. You got to go all the way to Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio to see the one they have there with the flaps in the retracted position. So now you can see the rockets getting ready to shoot these dish-shaped craft down. But it was the F-94s that were trying to intercept these dish-shaped craft. Here's Rudy's drawing that shows you kind of what this intercept may have looked like. Now, in, in that time frame, uh, 1952, we had the overfly in two consecutive weekends over the Capitol in Washington, D.C. So this happened in the early 1950s. Now, why is any of this important? Because that takes us to this letter that was written by Mildred Bissell, October 2nd, 1979, to Leonard. And I think it's important that we read this here. This is what this lady says to Leonard here. I heard you speak at the MUFON Symposium in Dayton last year, and I'm interested in your research on retrievals of the third kind. I gave a talk at a local library last week, and in the discussion period following, a fellow told me that when he was a gunner in the Air Force, he had emptied his guns on a UFO and had taken pictures with his gun camera that clearly showed the shells exploding against the side of the craft. He said the camera was taken off the wing of his plane when it landed and the pictures developed. At 2 a.m., a couple of military policemen came and got him out of bed and took him to the base auditorium. They ran the 17 seconds of movie of the UFO over and over and questioned him and two other crew members until 10 a.m. He was warned never to tell anyone what had happened. He said he had a wife and family and a good job and a lot to lose. He seemed afraid of the CIA and wouldn't even give me his name. So here's a firsthand account from a pilot who emptied an entire magazine of shells. It hit the side of this thing and they got it all on gun camera footage. And so you know, Carrie, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these gun camera footage going from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, all the way up to modern times where they've got they've got warehouses full of this gun camera footage and eight by 10 black and white glossy photographs of all these intercepts and other UFOs, military sources. This is the kind of firsthand evidence that we need to get brought into congressional hearings. Awesome. Yeah. For sure. All right, next. Classified materials library at an unknown U.S. Air Force base. The primary source was a former military officer, page 212, page 213. So he's in this materials library. He has the correct security clearance. He opens up one of these file cabinets and he starts pulling out these manila folders and he's looking through these manila folders. One of them was labeled crash retrieval. So he looks inside this folder and here's what he sees. This is Rudy's drawing. And this is Farmington, New Mexico. So we've got this Farmington tie-in here. Uh, this is prior to 1950. He sees a photograph of a 36-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. It had a dome on top. There were porthole windows wrapped around the outer circumference. And then there was a small pencil-sized hole that they could put a little pencil through. Basically, it was a very small hole that was within one of these porthole windows. And I wanna go over some of the key points within the reference material that he talked about here. This is all within the Springfield publication. Number one, military officer had the correct security clearance 
which gave him access to a classified materials library. Number two, reports seen by witness made reference to crashes and that bodies were recovered. This is back in 1950. Uh, in addition, uh, diamond tip drill bits and acetylene torches were used to gain access to the interior. Reference 1946 craft that we already talked about. And then the 1963 case that we'll talk about later on here. Number four, eventually technicians were able to gain access to the interior of the craft by way of a small entry hatch. The report said, referring to the door, that it was almost as if the material of the craft liquefied and then solidified again. Mm -hmm. So bottom line is, when these lab coat technicians examined the outer skin of these craft carry, the entryway hatches are so fully integrated into the craft, you can't put a razor blade in there. It's almost like liquid metal. That's what we're talking about here. This is what these lab coat technicians are telling us here. All right, next one, Pentagon, 1952. This is an office worker, page 152 in the book, case one. And this particular office worker apparently went down into the basement vault of the Pentagon. There absolutely is a vault at the Pentagon where they have a lot of this material. I can't say if it's still there, but at least by 1952, it was certainly there. So she goes through a double doorway into this off limits room and it's dark it's dingy there's some cardboard boxes stacked up she does a 180 carry and she sees a pickled alien in a glass jar basically is what she sees within five seconds she's apprehended by military police told to vacate the area immediately and then she has to sign paperwork stating that she's not going to talk about this well leonard eventually reached her for comment, she didn't want to discuss this, but I want to go to Joseph's illustration may have looked something like this uh -huh. at the underground vault at the Pentagon here. Okay, we're going to go on to the next slide here. Dutton, Montana, 1953. Primary source is a man named Cecil Tenney. He was a civilian. This is page 16 in the book. He's driving down this road, Carrie, and the oncoming traffic he sees this large cigar-shaped craft. It's tipped up at a 45-degree angle, and it's between 150 to 300 feet across, and it's belching out smoke and flames. And the cars coming in the opposite direction, he notices that they have their tailpipes caught on fire as he's watching all this. And so he goes down the road another five miles. He goes to a tavern and he makes a report. Later on, a police officer also makes a report. And the owner of the bar basically tells on the primary eyewitness. And he tells the policeman that a few minutes later, there was another gentleman who filed a report. That night, the primary eyewitness got a call from the base commander at the local base which you see in Rudy's drawing here. And the, and the general said, I want to see you. So next morning he shows up, he's interrogated for two hours. He's basically forced to sign non-disclosure agreements. And then as he's ushered out of the base, there's two men that have these potato sacks over their shoulders. One of them trips and falls down and this, potato sack falls off his shoulder and he can see what looked like Carrie. He described it as human body parts that were still in this bag. Now, he didn't know if they were human. Maybe they were ET, who knows? But to him, they look like body parts. Just Stop reporting it. it as it was reported in the book here. Now, this actually took place later at Great Falls Air Force Base. Now, Malmstrom Air Force Base which, as you know, is the home of the major UFO incident in 1967. I have to let my dog out. Keep talking, okay? Yep, Keep talking. where we have Robert Salas, okay? I know him. I interviewed him. The primary source, primary eyewitness. This I is uh, Great Falls Tribune, September 28, 2010. Ex-Air Force officers discuss UFO sightings. We had no less than 10 nuclear ICBM silos go offline at, at minimum 10, minimum 10. 
Here's uh, Rudy's drawing that shows you what this actually looked like. So we've got the launch control officer at the bottom of the silo in the launch control room. Up top, we've got this UFO, and they're communicating. You know, it's it's breaching the airspace here. And later on, when Boeing engineers came in, they discovered absolutely nothing wrong with this launch control operation. There was nothing wrong with the computer. So someone or something that had intelligence shut down our most critical national security defense assets. So something that we should consider here. Now, I also want to talk about this. This is San Sao Paulo, Brazil, December 7th, 1954. I want to highlight this case. This is in Brazil. A huge, peculiar cigar-shaped object appeared over Sao Paulo, Brazil on December 7th, 1954. The front part was large and round. The rest of the fuselage tapered down to it like a cigar. There were two open gaps near the backside where dense smoke was emitted. A wide opening was observed on the undercarriage of the object where three discs emerged with a metallic flare. They were said to have been red in color. Two of the disc-shaped objects split up with one heading in a southern direction while the other headed north. The third disc remained in the vicinity of the cigar craft and began maneuvering unbelievable aerial feats for an hour. The cigar-shaped <laughs> object finally rose upward and vanished in just seconds. So the point I'm making here is that this is not an isolated incident. Now we've got two reports, independent reports, of these large cigar-shaped craft belching out smoke and flames and explosions coming out of the back of these craft like they're desperately trying to keep themselves airborne that's what it's looking like from the primary researchers here now here's one of our first pass illustrations just to give an idea of what this thing looked like next one camp polk louisiana summer 1953 herman johnson is the source He's a private in the Army. This is case 8A1, page 80. And I want to go to the next slide here. This is Rudy's drawing. Now, the primary source said that he saw this from, from beginning to end. He saw the entire operation. When this thing came down, it was 30 feet across. It was an egg-shaped craft. It had a fin wrapped around the outer portion of it that was still rotating, Kerry. And where this thing came down, it had this, you could call it, Sedona, Arizona, copper colored ground. That's what it looked like where this thing came down. It was still warm to the touch. Now, when military police and uh, medical personnel got there, they assisted three ETs that walked outside the craft. So you can see them in Rudy's drawing walking out the craft. They were assisted by the medical personnel. There was one ET craft body that was carried on in a stretcher and it appeared that there was some type of communication going on between the comrades and their fallen comrade that was being pulled off on the stretcher. Now, these beings were three and a half to four feet tall. They were all wearing a one-piece tight-fitting flight suits. They had oversized head, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth, minute nose. They were wearing helmets, carry. They had mittens on. They had no knee joint. And so they had this stair step maneuver when they were walking, just a bizarre type walking, staggering here is what they were walking. I'm going to go to the next slide. And now you can see Joseph bringing this into view here. We've got the kind of the burning embers in the background. Again, this craft is approximately 30 feet across with a rim that was still rotating. Let's zoom in a little bit here. And now you can see these beings attended and assisted by medical personnel. We've got their mittens on and the helmets, according to the report. Right. We'll do another blow up here that shows you the interior craft, and now the comrade is being carried out. We'll go to the next slide, and now you can see kind of a blow up of what this one looked like. So again, we're already five, six, seven in. The body count's going up. The craft count is going up. Next one, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 1953. I, I really love this one. Michael Olvey, is the primary source. He was an army officer, uh, army reserves. He was a warrant officer. Page 15 in the book, abstract number eight is the source of where I get the information. So in this one, we have to picture the scene. You've got a four engine DC-7 transport, pulls up on the tarmac. 
it rolls into the tarmac into one of these hangars. Now this is hangar bay four at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. The wind, the arrow that I've got indicated is a hangar that I've already been in. I've actually been in this hangar. Now I can't prove it took place in this hangar, but it may have been in hangar complex number four at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Here's the front door of bay number E of complex number four. So you can picture this DC seven. I'm gonna to go to the next slide here. Rolls into the hangar, the hangar bay doors immediately close. This is all at night. And on the aft cargo port side of the DC-7, there is a cargo bay door that opens up. And then there's a forklift that rolls over and they start offloading on pallets, these wooden crates and carry. There were three wooden crates that had the tops pulled off. And this warrant officer is at the right place at the right time. He's close enough to look inside these crates. So he looks inside and this is what he sees, Kerry. He sees three ET bodies, three foot tall, oversized head, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth. They're all wearing a one piece tight fitting flight suit. They're suspended off the bottom of the crates by a white netting to protect them for the freezer burn dry ice below. And one of them was female. And so he's watching all this and there's boxes being pulled off to off to the side apparently associated with the crash retrieval operation. Now we're gonna to go to the next slide here. And here's Joseph's full color rendering of what this might look like. So this is another one of these crash retrievals that the senators and congressmen should be running to ground and finding out who was in charge of the operation, finding out their bosses that can get to not only the bodies, but the craft itself. So now you see the boxes in the background, who knows what kind of debris they might've retrieved could be dozens and dozens of actual ET hardware that was actually retrieved here. Here's a top view looking down, all wearing a one piece tight fitting flight suit suspended by this white netting to protect it from the dry ice freezer burn below. All right, next one, Walker Air Force Base, New Mexico, April 12, 1954. The primary source served in the Air Force between 1954 and 1955. This is page 82 in the book. This guy was an expert on photography and cameras. He was only 18 at the time when he joined the Air Force here, but he was an expert. And so he thought his skills could be utilized for aerial photography. All of a sudden he is called with three of his crew members. They're playing ping pong at the base at the time. And this is Walker Air Force Base, which is the same place previously as Roswell Army Airfield home of the 509th bomb group. So they all pile in this H-19 helicopter. There was a pilot in command who was new to them. They didn't even know who this guy was. And they said, gentlemen, this is like a, a code for uh, retrieval operation because they were involved, involved in search and rescue. So this was, a, this was not a drill, this was a real operation. So they take off, they head north of Roswell. The highway was to their right. They fly for about 10 minutes. They make a left-hand turn. Now they're heading northwest toward Corona. The sun had already gone down. And when they go over this cliff carry, they see this. They come across a 50-foot diameter dish-shaped crab that had augered in at about a 50-degree angle. And the pilot in command tells our witness to pull open this door and start taking aerial photography with a still camera so he's shooting this thing all different angles and they're only hovering above this thing at about a 30 foot altitude they have a spotlight shining down on this scene and he's watching all this i mean it's just crazy he sees the outline of four et bodies that were wrapped around kind of the outer portion of this craft then the helicopter lands about 100 feet away from this and then something happens that's very bizarre, Kerry. As soon as he gets out of the helicopter, he notices that the entire local vicinity of where this thing came down is permeated with this acrid smell of automobile battery acid. That's what this whole area smelled like. In fact, when the lights of the retrieval operation all the jeeps and vehicles came onto the scene. One of these MPs actually threw up right in front of this guy. I mean, this is a gruesome scene. 
they discovered two more ET bodies inside the craft for a grand total of six ET bodies. And there was a uh, red, white, and yellow colored lights wrapped around the outer circumference of the rim of the craft, which was still rotating counterclockwise. Here's Joel's full color rendering of what this may look like. So these ET bodies were obviously uh, recovered with the craft itself. Okay, next one. The other okay, one. Um, now I have one yeah. question or sort of a yes. comment question. Go ahead. But, um, you know, it begins to wonder, one, make you wonder if, if actually the ET bodies in in something like this case right. were uh, planted, and that the this craft itself could have been one of ours, and the battery acid thing sounds so like uh, something from a human thing, right? so that it could have been powered by some kind of faulty whatever and just saying that you know and then the 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 story gets told and it has these these little et bodies that are just manufactured because it could even be but back in those days they were building these little creatures um to mimic the actual crashed retrieval bodies that you know what i mean in other words and some were, were real and some were fake well, that's another narrative that we want to consider. Absolutely. We could be dealing with PLFs. We could be dealing with a narrative yeah. where they want to control people's psychological analysis of all this. Yeah, that's it's certainly a possibility. Yeah, that they were, you know, a lot of these, some of these seem like test flights, right? Well, that in went this wrong. case, we don't know how long this craft or the bodies were already out there. Right. So the bodies could be decomposing over three nights. And then they right. finally get on scene and it might have been the smell of the decomposing bodies. That might be what it was. Who knows? Uh -huh. right? We don't know for sure. But uh, all right. So we can go on to the next case here. Want to give credit to Ruben and Noe for doing all the legwork on the Mexican Roswell case. The other, other Roswell UFO crash on the Texas-Mexican border. This is spring 1955. Uh, Del Rio, Texas, just south of the Rio Grande River. So what we've got here is we've got multiple F-86s that are escorting at least two B-47s that are heading westbound and they're over southern Texas. So they're heading westbound, F-86s are with them, and then going against their flight path carry is this dish-shaped craft. One of these F-86s peels away he follows this craft all the way down just south of the Rio Grande River and sees this thing auger in. That's what you see in the cover of this book here. So he's watching all this. I'm going to go to the next slide here. This kind of gives you an idea exactly where this thing came down, south of Del Rio and immediately south of the vicinity of the, of the Rio Grande River. So what this guy does is he actually goes to... Uh, Carswell Air Force Base, he lands his F-86, he gets out, he goes to Corsica, he's joined by a friend, they both climb in a uh, single-engine tail-dragger Aranka, and they fly from Corsica back to the Christ site, because he knew where this thing came down. He got there before it became dark out, and when he got there, this is what he saw, a 25-foot diameter dish-shaped craft that left a debris trail, so the Aranka is in the right foreground, the upper dome had popped off this 25 foot diameter dish shaped craft. There was a whole breach on the side. At least four ET bodies were recovered, but it was gruesome because they were burnt almost to a crisp. Now, the primary source stated that as it got colder in the evening, because he got there just as you know the Mexican military got there before the Americans did, he said it started getting cold. And he mentioned that the Mexican soldiers went inside the six by six troop transport that you see on the upper left here. They pulled out these blankets and they put the blankets on the debris of the craft in the trail. The debris was still warm and it heated up the blankets and they put the blankets on their bodies to heat them up. That's a bizarre little statement, but I thought, hmm. That seems to end more credibility to this. Now, what I want to do now, Carrie, is I want to take you inside the craft now, and we're going to do a blow up. This is from Air Force pilot Robert Willing. He's the source of this information. He said that when he looked inside, the ETs had arms that looked like broomsticks. 
very emaciated arms that went down below the knees. I mean, we're talking about a, a gruesome scene here. Here is Joel's full color rendering of what the scene may have looked like back in spring 1955. So I'm going to do a blow up of the interior that shows you these uh, badly burnt bodies, dismembered. So we're not talking about a user friendly scene here. Eventually, the Americans got on scene, but the Mexicans got there before the Americans got to the crash retrieval scene. And did they say um, th how many fingers on the hand did you? Mm, I think it that? was four. I'm not quite sure. Okay. But I don't think he went into all that detail. But, you know, a, a lot of these black programs, the deepest of the black ones are when the American military steals these crash retrievals out from under the noses of other governments. That's something that goes on. Here. I now, think I, steal. I think they pay for it. I think they pay them know, large sums of money. That, that may be the case. And they're on call. I think they, they're called in right away. I think the United States has been doing this around the world for a long time. That's probably you know? They're going to stop at nothing to get this. That's you right. Know? They're going to be on the scene no matter what. Absolutely. How do you, how do you think they got, they know about these things? They're and trying. no amount of money is, is going to be under, you know, out of consideration because they're no going to definitely. Are, that's absolutely yeah. correct. All right. Next one, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in 1955. The primary source is a woman named Miss, Mrs. G. She worked in the foreign materials division at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And this comes from Charles Wilhelm, page 17 from the book. So let's go inside here. And this kind of reminds me of the closing scene of Indiana Jones Raiders of the Lost Ark. You can picture this large warehouse where you've got all these boxes stacked up. That's kind of the scene that we're talking about here. So inside Operations Building 258 is kind of what this scene looks like. But she stated that Carrie, she cataloged a thousand components that came in from a crash retrieval. A thousand components, in, including interior debris, hardware that came in from a crash retrieval. So when we talk about not having evidence, <laughs> it's her case against the United States government. She was actually cataloging a thousand pieces. So they can't claim that there's no evidence because she handled, she basically well, right and by her desk. And you and all the whistleblowers and the people that are testifying, uh, this is huge. I mean, I wish we would, you know, let's just, you know, out all this stuff because it's so obvious. I mean, this is just, you know, insane. And yeah, I mean, by the way, they would be chronicling just like you are, right? Well, so you're sure. doing it at your I'm own doing expense. It yes. yes, but you're like bird dogging their, their operations. So, um, you know, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, that's, there's no doubt about it whatsoever. You don't spend all that money to go pick up something, even in another country, be on the scene right away, et cetera, et cetera, use your personnel and such, and then throw it away. You're, you're it's, that's a, you know, just like those Springfield boxes you're talking about. I think they were confiscated. I know of some boxes in another state. I'm not at liberty to say much more about that, sure. but I can sure. tell you a person passed on and those boxes were confiscated immediately by the CIA. Okay, so this is Rudy's drawing that we came up with based on Mrs. G's testimony. Now, the way they had this thing set up, they had this thing that set up like a assembly line. There was one person kind of in the background. He was taking photographs of the debris. Then it moved to the next station where it's bagged and tagged. And then it moved to Mrs. G on the uh, right foreground here where she cataloged it. And then you can imagine that they had all this shelving where they put up all these ET artifacts, both on the left and right hand side. Now, she also mentioned that while she's doing all this cataloging work of a thousand pieces from, from a crash retrieval, there was a mobile dolly that went right by, kind of this mobile stretcher, and there were two ET bodies that were being preserved in this formaldehyde preservation fluid as it was going right by her. So not only did she handle and see the debris, but she saw the bodies as well. Right. And just before she died, Carrie, she stated this, quote, Uncle Sam can't do anything to me once I'm in my grave. Six months later, she died. 
we got her just in time, just in time. She's an American patriot and American hero. And I don't think this woman was lying to us. Why would she lie? Why would she make this up? She had nothing to gain. Not at all. Um, now, uh, there is a television show. Wasn't it called um, something like Hangar 13 or something? You mean for a while. In 1980, Hangar 18? No, the it's movie? not Hangar. There's a, I know there's a UFO video called that, called Ang Hangar 18. But no, this was a television show about this this kind of a place, right? Where they they stored all kinds of stuff. There was a MUFON TV so, uh, series called Hangar One, where they would go into the, these different cases. Maybe that's some. Maybe, different. maybe. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's take Rudy's drawing and let's go to the full color rendering. And this may be what that <clears throat> large warehouse looks like. So off to the left and right, we've got the metallic debris. We've got ET bodies being re, uh, recovered. We've got the formaldehyde. We've got the gold. We've got the jars. Something like this. In the foreground center, we've got the gentleman taking the photograph of the debris. It would be bagged and tagged, and then it would be cataloged by Mrs. G. And this is what's been going on for 70, 80 years now. Yeah. There's no telling me how many warehouses they have of this. Exactly. So they, they cannot claim that they don't have any physical evidence. They've got it, but they just don't have access to it. Yeah. Okay, actionable item. Since over a thousand components of physical ET hardware exists, this evidence should be tracked down by senators and congressmen with the appropriate security clearances and should be presented in open public congressional hearings. That's something that needs to happen for sure here. All right, next one. Retired Air Force pilot, late 1950s. Interview conducted by Ed Camerack Jr. And he basically interviewed this Air Force pilot who saw, according to the pilot, sometime in the late 1950s, a five to six minute movie clip that depicted this 60 foot diameter dish shaped craft in a hangar that had a dome on top, kind of porthole windows wrapped around the outer circumference. There was a hole breach on the side. And then this thing panned to another part of the scene where they showed the interior of the craft with these buttons and switches and dials and levers. And then off to the right, there were three ET bodies on stretchers with blankets covering. That's, in a nutshell, what this motion picture film reel is. So we need to get this one as well. So here's the blow up. There was a hole breach on the side of the craft with a quote unquote ET engine. So was there... Uh, an implosion? Did something hit? Was it an impact? We don't know for sure, but this is kind of what this film clip depicted here. Now, this is an interesting one. Wright Patterson Air Force Base in 1962. This is. And, um, uh, can you just wait right, one minute? Can you right back up one second? I want to ask sure. a question about this. Yep. Yeah. So the truck and what's in the, the back of the truck, are you saying no, that's an engine? Well, we don't know for sure, but something, something came Okay, out. and what year was this? Well, this is, this is uh, late 1950s was when this gentleman claimed that he uh, at least saw this motion picture film reel, five to six okay. minutes. Okay, because that would be very interesting to run by Dr. Um, David Adair, because when he was a kid, he was 17, uh, Curtis LeMay came to his door they brought him into a uh, very low down in area 51. He, he would walked up to something that was a described like that. Some, some like engine thing that was actually alive, but they couldn't get it to turn on. He pushed, put his hands on it and it turned on. It was AI driven. Yep. I, I am familiar with the account for sure. I mean, definitely familiar. It just sounds, a, you know, and it looks a little like, um, you know, it just looks a little like the description, that's all. I, I am familiar with the case. Um, April 1962, this is a group associated with the 350th Tactical Air Command Fighter Wing. This is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 62, page 88, case A6. Now, the leader of this, um, basically, this was a, a group of pilots that were going through the base. They weren't... Uh, permanently based there, but they were transient pilots. 
So the leader of this squadron is in charge of their health. And so they're kind of jogging down these rows of hangar. They're, they're looking for a mobile racquetball court, handball court. And they have to find this perimeter that completes the fourth wall in the report, it says that they were trying to complete the wall of this mobile racquetball court. And so they go down this hangar. One of these hangar doors was open. They look inside <laughs> and they see this 15 foot diameter dish shaped craft. It was propped up on two engine test stands. It had kind of this velvet rope wrapped around the outer circumference and there were MPs with rifles stationed around there. One of these MPs came to the squadron leader and said, I don't think you're supposed to be here, sir. And this guy said, you're right. So he did kind of an about face and they left. But they had a very interesting statement here. I want to talk about this. Here's what he said. The guard challenged by saying, I don't think you're supposed to be here, sir. I replied to the affirmative. And we turned about face and departed, mumbling to ourselves that the good old U.S. had developed or had all along flying saucers in service. So when you read this report and this account in the book, it, it just has the ring of truth carried. This squadron leader is not lying. He's telling us the truth. Uh, and you know, as they were leaving, they were mumbling to themselves, oh my goodness, you know, we've had these things all along. We've had these things, whether are they're ours or theirs, that they're reverse engineered or it's something that we've been putting right. together. We've got these things, and it's from the first-hand military sources and pilots that are telling us this. Okay, next one. December 1963, Cherry Point, North Carolina. This is a U.S. Marine. His name is Roy Baker. Been trying to track this guy down for 13 years now. He might, I don't know if he's still with us, but this is a critical case and critical uh, Marine here. Page 152 in the book, case two. So this is Cherry Point, North Carolina. Here's the map. It's just north of Havelock. I'm going to show you the map of uh, where it originated. So he's at this base. He is told to board a plane with blacked out windows. So he flies two and a half to three hours by plane from Cherry Point, North Carolina. And they go to a facility. When they get to the facility, and he was a guard in the Marines. They open up these hangar doors. He looks inside and he sees a 40 foot diameter dish shaped craft, 15 feet tall. It looks like a fat hamburger. There's about nine elliptically shaped opaque windows wrapped around the outer circumference of it. The outer skin has this chrome metallic reflective exterior. There's no rivets. There's no seams. There's no socket head fasteners. There's no hex head fasteners. There's no bolts. This thing is antiseptically sterile. Um, as he's watching all of this, he notices that there is this minute seam, but it looks so fully integrated, you can't put a razor blade in there. And then he notices that this whole thing is propped up on scaffolding about five feet off the floor. And it has a catwalk where you can walk around this whole thing. And he notices white lab coat technicians desperately trying to breach the hull of this craft, which you see with these red dots here, are the attempted point of entry. And I'm going to go to the next slide. Here's uh, Joseph Wraith's illustration shows you the attempted point of entry where they were trying to get in with a diamond tip drill bit. So they put this drill right on the seam of this door, and that didn't work. They also try to puncture these windows that really weren't windows, but they were opaque. And they, they couldn't get in with the diamond tip drill bit either. These are the three attempts that they made. Number one, diamond tip drill bit failed. Number two, acetylene torch, that failed. Number three, this is all 1963, they had a laser that failed as well. Now, there's been some pushback on whether or not they had lasers in 1963. They absolutely did have lasers in 1963. What is in question is how effective it was and the intensity of the laser back in 1963. I'm going to go to the next slide here. Now, Kerry, this is somewhat of a world exclusive. This is the original, repeat, original sketch from Roy Baker, the man who actually saw the crap. He guarded this thing in December 1963 for a period of two weeks. 
at this undisclosed location. So this is his original sketch. I'm going to break this thing down. Upper and left-hand corner, you've got high-intensity lights. He mentioned that this thing was excruciatingly well lit. There were no shadows in this facility. He mentioned this. Now, if you look on the scaffolding here, there's an entryway off to the left and an entryway off to the right. You've got the craft kind of in the center, and then supporting the craft, you've got these pads that's talked about here. The opaque windows are kind of like blackened in here. And if you look at the second one to the left, you've got this little circle. That's the attempted point of entry for the diamond tip drill bit. So in a nutshell, this is his original sketch. I'm going to go to the next slide here. This is Michael Johnstone's somewhat refined drawing. Now, Michael Johnstone interviewed Roy Baker back in 1986, and he eventually facilitated a telephone call between Roy Baker and Leonard Stringfield. They actually did get to talk on the phone. So in this drawing from Michael Johnstone, you can see this one inch lip between the outer exterior, the skin of the craft and the outer portion of, of these old peak windows, something that you could feel with your thumb is what he talked about here. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. This is my refined AutoCAD drawing here. And you can see this detail view that I've put together here showing you this one inch lip. And I'm gonna rip through some of these bullet items here. Craft was seen at an undisclosed military location three hours by plane from Cherry Point, North Carolina. Number two, the entire craft was surrounded with, with what looked like standard military aircraft scaffolding. Number three, a white circle was taped to the floor which outlined the prohibited area for Air Force generals, okay? So directly below this craft carrier, there was a white tape circle and his orders were shoot to kill anyone who tried to breach that circle. I'm mean, talking about generals, Air Force personnel, anybody who didn't have clearance, shoot to kill first, then ask questions later. Next one, between three to four US Marines guarded the craft while it was temporarily in the hangar. Next one, the windows of the craft were indented toward the interior, forming a one inch lip. That's what you see in the detail here. The primary eyewitness secretly took a photograph of the saucer, which was later lost in a flood back in 1983. A team of between 20 to 50 engineers examined the craft, but were unable to gain access to the interior. Let's go to the full color rendering by Joseph Rafe. And now you can kind of see this whole thing coming into view here. And this was the original first pass illustration that I commissioned John McNeil to do for me here. Now, after the diamond tip drill bits failed and after the acetylene torches failed, they brought in two 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy trucks with these large electrical generating devices on them. And they had these heavy thick gauge cables that that ran to the interior of the hangar, and they were using this laser to shine onto the exterior of the craft itself. It bounced off, reflected, and damaged the upper ceiling panel of this facility. This is all talked about within the report by Roy Baker. Now, what I want to do now, Carrie, is I want to take you inside the facility. We are going to breach the security outer perimeter chain link fence. I'm going to take you inside the facility now. We're gonna hop over the chain link fence. Now we're going inside the hangar here. Credit goes to Joseph Wraith. Let's do a little bit of a blow up. You can see this perimeter tape section on the lower section of the hangar facility. We've got the white lab coat technicians. We've got the guards. Coming into view are some of these uh, spook group CIA types. That's what you see on kind of a left foreground. If you look closely, you can kind of see these this little lip that made up that one inch lip. Off to the right, you see the entryway to the scaffolding with the catwalk where you can walk around this thing approximately, and we're looking about a five foot 10 here off the hangar floor. Let's zoom in a little bit larger here. Now you can see these lips on the uh, perimeter of these opaque windows coming into view. And if we do another, this is about a 45 look down angle of the entire scene. So off to the left, you've got these CIA types and a close, the, the white lab coat technicians. And then this is all back in December 1963. 
literally a couple of weeks after Kennedy was assassinated November 22nd, 1963 at Dallas, Texas. So the last day he was there, Kerry, he said that the craft was being pulled off the scaffolding. It was being put onto a cradle device that was connected to the aft end of an 18-wheeler tractor trailer. They were dropping it down, and then they were putting tarps over the craft and putting chains over the tarp. So let's go to the next slide. Now you can see this cradle device being built up. We'll move on here. They're tarping the craft now. We're basically fully tarped. And now we're going to move to the next slide, and we're moving outside the facility. And I'm going to go to Rudy's drawing that shows you kind of the beginning or ending of the facility where they were just bringing it in. So the two ways they keep these under wraps is, number one, they compartmentalize the information. There's no one person that knows the whole story. So you compartmentalize. And if they do, it's a very small group. Number two is they continue to diversify their portfolio by moving these assets from one base to the next. So like these guards were there for two weeks, they moved it, they're no longer assigned to this thing. They move it to the next thing. Then there's another group of guards, but the two don't meet. So they keep moving these things from base to base. And that's one way that they keep these things under wraps. Now, here's a detailed view of this incident with the laser where it bounced off the skin reflector and then damaged the ceiling tile. And here's the actual incident here. That's talked about in this report from Roy Baker. Here's the sketch of where it actually took place. And you can see the drawing here. He also mentioned, this is according to Roy Baker, that all these lab coat technicians, they had these color-coded badges. And he said that if you had a green badge, you could go here inside the facility. If you had a yellow badge, you could go here. If you had a red badge, you had complete access to the entire facility. So this, this whole concept of color-coded badges, that pops up again and again on these retrieval operations. Now, there was one time, Curry, that he was left alone in this facility because his job is to frisk people coming in and basically frisk them going out there was one time where he was left alone and nobody frisked him as he got into the hangar. And he took a small Minox camera and he took a photograph of this thing. And this is his quote. Someday I will tell this story and by God, people are going to believe me. But in a flood in 1983, it was, it was lost. So we were this close to getting this photograph of this craft. So I told Joseph, I said, Joseph, please put together for me a replica of what this small Minox camera photograph may have looked like. And here's what Joseph came up with. So it would be kind of wrinkled. It would be off color, somewhat brownish, out of focus, somewhat maybe looking something like this. But we were this close to getting an actual photograph of this whole thing. Now, he also mentioned, according to Roy Baker, there was a U.S. Navy secretary who was just about shot because he almost reached this outer circumference tape circle on the floor. And I tracked it down to this gentleman, Paul Nitz, between November 1963 uh, to June 30th, 1967, is when this guy served as a secretary of the Navy. He would have been this gentleman. So this is someone to track down the records for. Now, that brings us to four-star General Melvin F. McNichol. He was base commander Tinker Air Force Base. This is his obituary. Ex-Tinker Commander Melvin McNichol dies the Daily, Oklahoma, July 11th, 1986. The reason why I'm bringing him up is because he was good friends with Charlotte Mann, who was involved in the 1941 Cape Girardeau crash retrieval. She actually held a photograph that showed at least one ET body being propped up under its armpits. These two were friends they had a mutual interest in UFOs. And so Charlotte turns to the general and says, General, you know, we've got this mutual interest in UFOs. Are you going to brief me on anything? Are you going to tell me anything about what you know about UFOs? Any secret information? He turns to Charlotte and he says, Charlotte, if you ever repeat what I'm about to tell you, I'll deny it and it could end my career. Here's what General McNichol told Charlotte Mann. Number one, he saw a UFO which was located in the West. 
that checks out with the Marine because he said he went three hours by a plane from Cherry, North Carolina. That brings you within the vicinity of the West. Number two, he walked around a UFO on a catwalk, which was propped up by a scaffold. This is exactly what the Marine had just said. Okay. Number three, he said that bodies were recovered. One was still alive. The Marine said in the report that he overheard water cooler talk between these white lab coat technicians about bodies being recovered and one was still alive. So, Carrie, when I heard this from Charlotte six years ago at IUFOC in Phoenix, when I heard her talk about what Melvin McNichol told her, I knew I had a real case because she had talked about exactly what the Marine had mentioned. These two, I'm sure, didn't know each other. So we had secondary independent confirmation that there actually was such a retrieval operation. And of course, we got enough crash retrieval cases to go on and on to the next ice age. But I just wanted to give you a brief <laughs> overview of some of these mission critical cases that need to be really brought into the public domain with congressional hearings. Yeah, fabulous. OK, well, that's amazing. Um, now, can you, uh, you know, yeah. uh, if we're done with the fly slides, just uh, sure. just uh, stop sharing. That's stop all. sharing. OK, good. Yeah. Okay. Now we're back here. Good. OK. So, OK, mm -hmm. um, yep. this is, you know, I mean, it's rather intense for people that aren't used to it, but right. it's great detail. And uh, obviously, this could be placed before you could do a hearing, you know, a congressional hearing. And so. you, yeah. you you basically sit stand up there and 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 go through all of this uh congress could be uh you know made aware and the american people so these are the kinds of things that that are really really her quiet heroic gestures and uh, i want to thank you michael schratt for being who you are for your attention to detail your wonderful artistic uh renderings by your your the people that you you know, have been helping you out. And uh, do you want, do you have a donation or anything like that where people can help you, you know, finance your, uh, your investigations? Really it must cost button. money. I've got my YouTube channel. Um, I'm All constantly right. putting out new material. Uh, I've got my book, Dark Files, a pictorial history of lost, forgotten, and obscure UFO encounters. I, I do have a PayPal, but you know what? To me, this is a crusade. We've already paid for this stuff with our own tax dollars. We own this and we need to preserve an important part of our right. national history. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. Well, um, you know, I know you work during the day. You're coming here in the evening to give us a report. And yeah. I just want to thank you for your diligence and your professionalism. <laughs> so I think that, uh, you know, Hopefully this this video will get get out there and uh, and and you'll do more in the future. So you're very welcome to come back. Great. And uh, you know, heads up to Grush and Luna and Burkett and you know, let's let's move on with this stuff. You know, let's okay. let's get this out there. Thanks, Carrie. Appreciate it. All right. You take care. Take care. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks. Bye.